Vivian, thank you so much for being here today. So I'm very excited to talk about Kafka. Um, and um, you've made me reread a lot of the things that Kafka published during his lifetime. Uh, the short prose, the really small fragments that are inhabited by these strange little creatures <laughs> that sort of stay with you for a long time. Mm -hmm. So um, the one um, thing maybe I want to start talking about is uh, one of the parables of the little mouse. If, you, if that's okay, we can start with that one. With pleasure. And you're absolutely right about these creatures that stay with you for a long time. Ultimately, they may stay beyond that long time because one of the little creatures, maybe the epitome of the little creatures, is one called Odradek. Yeah. In the story, the warrior of the house father, yeah. there's this creature roaming around in the house and really unsettling the house father, the pater familias, and the last line says that the real worry of the house father is that Odradek might outlive him. So if you're, worried, if you're worried that they stay with you for a long time, they could live beyond us, yes. So that's what, that's what the ultimate worry is. Well, I, w I was thinking of these little creatures. I mean, Kafka is known for the three big novels which were published posthumously, mm -hmm. The Trial, The Castle, America. But these little stories, they are little creatures. They're little things. The most famous one in the Metamorphosis is probably Gregor Zamsa turns into a giant bug. Not little, but at the same time, the littlest thing we don't ever want to see. So there's something about scale. So the little mouse parable is one of those. And the, many of the other ones are about the things that don't have agency, don't have subjectivity but somehow in Kafka attain, and I'm, I'm curious about what you think they attain. I don't know what status they have. Oh, they, they have what it takes to unsettle that which is, or thinks it is, stable and static and strong and certain. And it takes not much and maybe this is indeed what I would like to talk about. It doesn't take much to, to unsettle fundamentally that whole sense of life. You can see it you know, more politically as a sense of um, you know, power, mm -hmm. but you can also see it uh, more ontologically as what we consider to be reality. You can see it metaphysically uh, as to, to the meaning of life and where we are, and you can see it as the, the first little text we thought we'd talk about, in terms of the history of civilization. Uh, a little thing that can undo all your assumptions mm -hmm. about what things are about. And this is quite a big thing. And to <laughs> undo the foundations of everything from this little tiny thing. Yeah. So what you said, there's been a huge literature on Kafka. So they have read him as an existentialist, the human condition, as a political prophet who anticipates the bureaucracy, the terrible sort of devastations of the 20th century, how the state has total control, metaphysically, religious, psychoanalytic, psychological. So everybody has tried to build a big system and put, put, puts, puts Kafka in it. But you're saying there's something tiny that can undo even... Well, you said, you said the word, what it can undo. It can undo the system, mm -hmm. uh, any kind of system, because it shows that we are inhabited with a kind of model, a system of how the world works. We want the world to make some sense, right? We want to know these are the chairs we sit on, we're yeah. talking here, we're in this room. Because we read it some gives books. Us a sense of control. Yeah. And in the, it is indeed, doesn't take much to show that this is a total illusion. Now, what we do with that is another, is a, you know what follows? What follows mm -hmm. once this disorder is undone? Kafka doesn't completely tell us, but that is where reading Kafka happens. It happens in that moment when these certainties are undone, when these assumptions fall away, uh, 
And when you become uh, sensitized to another mode of reality, hmm. which is, uh, I'd, I'd love to sh show you that on a few, uh, in a, f in a yeah. few little places. And he does this sometimes microscopically. Sometimes it can be the lack of a comma. Mm -hmm. It can be the most banal sentence or situation mm -hmm. that can do that. And sometimes it can be such a sudden inversion of a situation that uh, you haven't even realized what happened. Right. And at the end of two, three sentences, you find yourself in another place. But that's what I thought, reading these sometimes very compact little parables, so they're less than a page. And something surprising happens, as you just said, but somehow it's within this little tiny space, and it's so surprising and startling, and in a completely different space right after. Yeah. But it's not that he yanks you out of it and says, now this big thing happened. He said, there's a tiny shift, and it's a completely different. And so the, the story of that uh, was given the title uh, of the little parable, yeah. but that is just, it's three sentences. Alas, said the mouse. In German, ach, sagte die mouse. <laughs> ach. <laughs> It's what, it yeah. it's what a mouse would say. It's what a mouse would say. Ah, I'm only a mouse. <laughs> I think it's a wonderful word to start a conversation <laughs> on Kafka with. <laughs> Ach, alas, said the mouse. Yeah, it, the alas sounds different. Alas sounds kind of um, elegant. <laughs> ach, ach sounds a little more despairing. It's, ach, you're just sighing. You're not actually. <laughs> alas, said the mouse. The world gets smaller every day. At first, it was so wide that I ran and was happy to see walls appearing to my right and left, but these high walls converge so quickly that I'm already in the last room, and there in the corner is the trap into which I must run. But you've only got to turn around, said the cat, and ate it up. I slightly uh, changed the uh, English translation yeah, yeah, you gave me here yeah, because it's yeah. crucial. Du musst dich nur umdrehen. It says you, you got to turn the other way. You but it doesn't around. work because yeah. it, for, it doesn't get the so situation yeah. that the cat is running behind the mouse and says you just have to turn around and ate it up. <laughs> so. I claim that mm -hmm. in these three sentences, mm -hmm. so one is the very short one, the last said the mouse, the world gets smaller every day. And then there's a long sentence where you notice, and I, I exaggerated mm -hmm. that a bit, you get out of breath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At first it was so wide, started running, and then you're running with the mouse. Until the end, and then there's the last little thing. Tell what is this about? Well, I claim, that this is the history of civilization, the entire history of civilization. <laughs> Yuval Hariri in three sentences, okay. Rousseau in three sentences. And it situates us in modernity, because it says, you know, the world gets smaller every day. So, and at the end you get the word trap. There's so the a suggestion that the present modernity is becoming a trap. But how did it all start? And it starts the entire history of civilization with the idea, and an idea that uh, exists in anthropology. And At first it was so wide that I started running. The sense of, you know, nothing being there. Right. Uh, you know, prehistoric, there is, there's no orientation, there's no direction. And then humans, actually sort of, of spread fear. out all out over the world. Fear. They start running. <laughs> it was so wide. Uh, in English, you don't even have the word fear. Mm -hmm. I, he, in German, I don't know, I don't remember the yeah, exact uh, yeah. term, but it's out of fear. It is frightening to be... Because you're too exposed. To, to you're too exposed. exposed. And, you're little, and, you and, don't know and, and you're a little mouse, like all of us. You are too exposed. The world is too big. But yes. then the world gets smaller. And then he starts running, and there's a little moment of happiness. Mm. Because he sees walls 
from a distance. Mm -hmm. He sees the walls in the distance. There is some kind of, you know, culture arises, civilization. Walls are being built, and from far, they are soothing and they are comforting and they are giving him a kind of, a uh, you know, a, a, the hope for something stable. So they're not limitation. They are guidance. They're like from 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 far, far away. So they give us a sense of orientation. There's a left and a right. Now we're in relation to something rather exactly. than exposed to, which we don't quite know what Kafka says we're exposed to. Right. Right. Which that's a, it's not the universe or the cosmos. So these walls give these you guidance. Walls. So th from left, uh, they appear on right and left. And there is immediately a but, a crucial word in yeah. Kafka, because something's turning around. So from this little moment of happiness, I was happy to see walls appearing to my right and left. But these high walls converge so quickly that I'm already in the last room and there in the corner is the trap. Because the mouse kept on running. The mouse kept running and the, but the, walls, and the walls close in on him. Yeah, yeah. And, at the end and that's why you, that's what you think civilization is also as an allegory, or if you want to say it here, it's a that, view of modernity that, that more that is built up, and more, we have more structures, more ways of thinking of the world. So it's both conceptual and material, also for Kafka. So suddenly, what used to give us some political. guidance, and we like it initially. We want initially systems we to give us some direction yes. to how to think about ourselves, right? And then, and within half the sentence, we, we go from that <laughs> moment. Of, you know, this makes sense of, the, of us and the world, and too. Yeah. This and has now restricted us so much. And this is where modern, Kafka finds himself as... And say something, man. what do you mean by modernity in this context? It's not just that they were trains invented. And Kafka is writes around 1910 okay. or something like that. He writes quite a lot, actually, about the speed of, of culture, people running around. It's the beginning of sort of mass population. Yeah, but it is also the moment at the end of the 19th century, where or already with Nietzsche, when you feel that history is a burden, that there's been a too much, that there is something that doesn't allow for, so the whole vitalism, the whole, you know, there is some, the avant-garde, they arose from having to make tabula rasa, there is something, there's a too much of civilization that, right. had, that has uh, confined us, that has locked us in. And well, of and, and, and life is, that has and life doesn't become is not lived, but it's conforming. You have to sleep in yeah. certain ways. You have to go to work. There's clocks invented, trains. You have to make time. When before that, you rose presumably with the sun. I read Walden on this podcast, and Baudelaire, who say life is so regimented by the mid 19th century that it's not even life anymore. We're not living our lives. I'm just living the life when I'm supposed to get up, when I'm supposed to go to school, when I'm supposed to eat, when I'm, what I'm supposed to eat. Everything is prescribed. So they feel this precisely too that. much. Yeah. So they want to break out of that. So there is that kind of orderliness yeah. that then... But what's interesting is that these, um, these values of the Enlightenment uh, that have turned into the bourgeoisie socially, uh, they were already contested in Romanticism, but they're contested in a very different way in, in Kafka. Mm -hmm. It is not that you show the other side of, the, uh, of humanity that has been marginalized or repressed, but Kafka drives us to the bitter <laughs> end of these values. Right. So, you know, like, you know, rationality, the whole hope of the Enlightenment, it's right. not that you say, no, no, there is also madness and there's also the emotion and this. No, no, it is rationality that becomes madness. Okay. So yeah. uh, you get, um, for example, in The Burrow, in one of uh, the late stories, you get f fantastic 40 pages uh, of an animal that starts out saying, my burrow... You know, it's, it's the best uh, one. <laughs> ...is completed and it is fine. Now, actually, there's maybe something wrong right there at the opening and at the entrance, and I have to, I don't know how I'm going to get the food. Should I bring it all together or should I disperse it? But if I have it all together and if somebody, an enemy comes and he's going to, and you get these totally rational uh, argumentations, step by step by step, and you see that at the same time, this very rationality becomes what, you know, c can be called the, the, the hypertrophie des Bewusstseins in German, you know, consciousness <laughs> that just... Too much. 
this we think too much, actually. So in the borough, for 40 pages, he's building a little tunnel system underground. He's totally safe. Except the one area where the, one of the entrances is kind of just covered up and someone could step in and fall in. But he said, I could cover it up, but then one has to be really open, have to escape. And that thought leads to pages and pages of thinking. Is it better to close it? Is it better to keep it open? Maybe there are other animals underground who are also burrowing. I will encounter them. They could be my enemy. I can already feel its teeth in my thigh. And you know it's the mind burrowing itself into what could be anticipated. How do you construct your life? I could go this way. I could go that way. If I went this way, maybe this would be safe because I'm really safe now. But being too safe is kind of risky because if you're really safe, then you're locked in. So you're kind of in a cave and you have no way to get out. So safety is actually maybe a threat. So it keeps on turning on itself. And goes so far, it goes even one step further than, you know, the enemy maybe. At one point he says, you know, he hears a little noise. Is this, is the enemy here? Is it one enemy? Are there many anim uh, enemies? Is it one big enemy? Am I in another's burrow? <laughs> <laughs> right, he's no longer in his own mind, <laughs> yes. It's not, it's not even, so uh, there is something there that makes rationality itself go mad. But it's interesting that Kafka nonetheless uses what's called rationality and language to write himself into this, not like the romantics or the avant-garde, the surrealists who say, let's blow up the system, let's get out no, of no, it, no. let's put in sex, violence, and drama, and sort yeah. of that's the outside of this modern regulated life. Kafka who was an insurance accountant, who had a presumably not such an interesting job, and wrote every night. So for him, and you talked about earlier when we talked about the end of the diaries, and he says at some point, I'm nothing but literature. So he uses rationality to force it into a place where, and this is the place where the mouse is now. So it's, it's not there's an escape to say, oh, we can... Well, there is something much there too. He goes a step further because we haven't talked about the last sentence in that little parable. Yeah. Because when the cat says, you've only got to turn around, said the mouse, said the cat, and ate it up. Well, what is this cat? So we have the trap of modernity and then we have all those ideologues who say, just turn around, follow oh. me. Oh. And you get, you could tell the history <laughs> of the 20th century. As another promise. As another promise. Wow. And imagine that Kafka does this. Like all those who have, who have promised yeah, to right. those who felt that they now were, you know, disoriented, that they were trapped in modernity, that they were right. isolated, because isolation is another of those values of the Enlightenment that started out as the autonomy of the self. Right. And it turns into, and you, get, you see in, in Kafka, you get you know, these figures who, they go one step further than the isolation is the solipsism, that the whole world is actually right, right, in, right. Your, in your head only. So the enlightenment idea of think for yourself, exactly. don't adhere to any program, no more superstition, no more religion. Kafka says, you are then really abandoned. And then, so you freed and yourself see, from everything, but then you, and then realize suddenly that actually exactly. now you're in, so, so the cat is a temptation. So the cat is the one to all those who feel tra trapped right. in modernity. The cat will say, you know, just follow me. I'll save you from Turn around. modernity. Let's talk about the solidarity of the, you know, of the workers and you'll be part of it and you will again be part of a community. You will again be part of a, of a political community, a religious right. community, a community of workers, or, uh, you know, you will be a national community. Right. And you hear all the, all the Führer and all, the, all those yeah, yeah, yeah. who will have the solutions for this modern man. And Kafka, within, it's not even a sentence, it's <laughs> five words, five words. T turn just turn around, just turn around and ate it up. <laughs> <laughs> and there it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, if you if you can imagine that that you know in a, in a little story. We so talk so about let me get to okay. So the cat, yeah. in some ways, it's the terrible figure of the seduction, the temptation of the political solution. They say, "You are a worker. I can help you. You are 
a Jewish boy in Prague. You are the minority speaking German community. You're Bohemian, you're Austrian, you're losing your entire country. Kafka lived through losing a country. Doesn't fit in. So all these solutions offer to somebody who does, doesn't feel enfranchised. Then who is the cat who Kafka is writing? So he's also inventing the cat. In this parable, he's, the, he's not the mouse and he's not the... So in some ways, yeah. after this little parable of a few sentences is over, how can Kafka give us the mouse and give us the cat? Okay. I'm so it's not a critique. I'm saying in sort of in some ways, this is all bad. He said, this is... So where's his position? <laughs> um, I think that to talk, when you talk about literature and real literature, there is no such thing as a position. Yeah. And a perfect <clears throat> example of where he would situate the cat is the narrator of the little story Gemeinschaft community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because so this is an incredible story. It's a half a page long, and I think this is the key to what we're living through today in the 21st century. I think the two stories, the one called Gemeinschaft and the other Gemeinschaft uh, von Schurken, so it's community it's a com and community of scandals, together, yeah. if you take them yeah. together, they, they really... And they're also half a page or a page long or yeah. something, community. So community, tell me about the community. It's the five so people. So it starts with the word we. Yeah. And you asked who is the cat? The we could be one of those cats who say we, you know, we are a community. We, you, you, you know, you, you're not alone. You, you know, there is this possibility of forming a community. And Kafka shows what, uh, what the consequences are. Hmm. And he does. This is really where you can see how um, how microscopically Kafka uh, works. Uh, do you, I but know the, the community more part. Part, this is, part. This is so. There's that we are five friends, and we once stepped out of a house all together. First, the first the first came, then the second one. He stood next to the gate. Then another one came. He slid into it, and then the third one, and the fourth one, and the fifth one, and finally we were all there. Okay. So he starts now, out just creating a little scene, and he says, we are five friends. So what is he setting up here? Okay. Yeah. You may not have realized <laughs> that you made a logical <laughs> mistake when you <laughs> said this. Yeah, what's and the mistake? Say, you say, we are five friends. Yeah. One day we came out of a house. So one day, any day, we came out of a house, they're both undefined. Right. Two, three sentences later, there will be this house and there will be this day, yeah. this time, this place. But there's something else. When you say, one day, we came out of house. It's the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth. There's a problem. What, what did you... There's a logical problem. Well, because he's already speaking of a we before and there was another. How would you say this when you say, we walked out of a house? First to first. First to first, second to third to fourth, and there's something missing. And then me. Yeah. Well, first me. <laughs> I, I, because there has to be an I before it okay. becomes a we, okay. presumably, so, right? So by the end of the he, first sentence, yeah, yeah. the individual has disappeared. So you know something about what this communities are about that Kafka depicts here. First of all, they eat up the individual and hmm. eat up. By the end of the first sentence, the eye is gone. See, I felt kind of a little bit happy right now. I thought, oh, we're five friends and the first, and I kind of forgot that I was erased in this. And I thought, yes. there's a second. And actually, it's amazing that literature can because open up, from a distance. but can open, open up a temporality that's not logical. Because he speaks from a we, but he's then enumerating them. Yeah. But that's not how logic works. But it could. W but it's working on some other level. You're saying because it performs it. Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't talk about it. It just does it, and you don't realize. You Which, haven't realized that you. Right. That you disappear. Well, because you want to join community and forget yourself. There you are. And okay. I want to join community, and in that moment, in the performance, you're standing with five people. Now you have forgotten yourself. They yes. say we are five. But the, yeah. the rest of the story is the price. So tell, tell us how the, the rest of the story goes. Of, so this is this forming these kind of communities. And it's also just to say how Kafka works. So he sets up a story, as you said. We are five friends. There's a house. It's generic. So somehow 
And I want to talk about this after you tell me how the story goes. What is the price to pay? There's something that could be considered generic or universal. It applies to anybody. Anybody knows friends, house. It's not specific to something. So I'm kind of. So I'm going to talk about that a bit. Why does Kafka allow so many people to read it and find them or lose themselves in rather? Okay. But let's so how does the story go? So the five are now standing out. I'm happy to be totally unconsciously erased. I forgot that I'm even part of it. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that happens is that he undermines all founding myths. Because every community, and you know, he's, you're completely right that this is, it's not just universal uh, because it's generic in, you know, it could be... It could be anywhere in the world, right? It could be in the, in the courtyard of a school mm. with five little friends. Mm. It could be five nations. Mm. Mm. Um, so it, it is really, you know, open in that sense. And yet it says something very succinct. And it says it with microscopic means. So, for example, uh, you know, one day five friends, maybe they walked out of the house and stand uh, one next to the other because, uh, because it was raining and maybe there was a bus stop. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know. and there's a roof and you're kind of covered. Right but, there. of course, communities create founding myths. You know, Romulus and Remus, right, right, right. nature nurtured us, right? Jefferson, it's, Madison, had, I mean, yes, okay. exactly, yeah. We the Mayflower, yeah, right, exactly. Um, we had to be here, no, maybe it was just raining. <laughs> maybe five people got together. So the contingency of it, right. that's one thing. But then there is the crucial moment when Kafka creates a sentence. We are five friends. We could live in peace ever since we've been together. We would, we would live peacefully together if this sixth one wouldn't be there all the time and would come, want to join us. And he even says the five, we don't even know each other that well. We actually that, weren't that even comes, friends. Look, even before, even before that, the fünf sind jetzt, so, seitdem, since then, we live together, comma, it would be a peaceful life. And then there is a comma here that doesn't really exist mm -hmm. in the manuscript. Mm -hmm. Didn't even make a comma to allow you to halt for a second before saying that if there wouldn't be the sixth one. Mm. It is in one go. Mm -hmm. So it's not, we lived peacefully together. And one then, day a sixth came. Yeah. It is yeah. not like that. It is constitutive. The very fact that there is not even a comma, not even a moment, of a peaceful living together yeah. without that sixth one suggests that you need the exclusion of the sixth one for the very uh. constitution of the community. That means that every community of that kind, a closed community, can only exist through excluding the other. Uh. And the rest of the story is a fantastic parody and we could, you know, just right. read the papers or <laughs> listen to the news, listen to our politicians, and we'd hear the, the rest of the story as a parody of giving reasons, a perfectly rational, the tone is rational. We cannot accept the sixth one because we cannot accept it. Why cannot we accept it? Because we are already five and there want to be six. Right. Now, of course, we don't know him. We don't know each other either, but that is different. Because we're already because five. Because we're already five, and we don't want to be six. And then there is this ominous sentence, we are together because of our experiences. Now, you know, in, in literature, <laughs> the, exp the text works in itself. What are the experiences? No, they are the exclusion of the six. They are the fact that they one day came out of the house. And they were and five. They, they were five, and they oh. exclude the six. These are the experiences. And that's the other part you said, every community constitutes itself, not just a founding myth, which is some original myth or whatever, the Mayflower or whatever, but our experience and our shared, we don't even like each other that much, but we're in this together. And this other person wants to join, but that is not the experience. We are because we already had this experience. So it's not even it's so perfectly harmonious and fantastic, but just the fact that we are here means there's something here to yes. hold on to, and we have to protect this because the sixth one would 
What would he? In reality, he's the one who makes us be a group. Yeah, yeah amazing. Doesn't even say so, what he right, would. Right. Nothing. He just wants to join. And therefore, and then there is also this fantastic sentence, we cannot explain this to him because if we would start talking to him, we would already have accepted him among <laughs> us. <laughs> we can't talk to him. All explanations would already have. But that also mm. is addressed to the reader because it says to the reader, if you accept this as explanations, mm -hmm. you already you're already part of the group. You're already part of the group. Okay. Yes. Yes. So in some ways, he's giving you in the work this, but he says, I c what I'm performing here is not possible. It would already have opened up the group. Yes. So as a reader, you exactly. brought in exactly. almost in spite of yourself. Unless Even if I agree, I want to be part of the five, and I see this is rational, you're already participating in both exactly. the exclusion if you and... Ex exactly. If you accept this, yeah, yeah. This, re th this reasoning, it's really You're interesting. Really the and the first sentence, read the first sentence again in English. So it's kind of amazing because it, it's a we, cause we're in America. There's we, the people, mm -hmm. which a lot of other people have read. They have to constitute themselves as a community before they are a community. We and are five friends. One day we came care. out of a house. First, the first came, stood next to the door, then the second who slid as lightly as a, a quicksilver. You, you know why? <laughs> like a little ball of quicksilver. Like a little ball. You remember those um, thermometers? Yes, of course. As a child, when they, when they broke, you had this. Yes. Uh, because in chemistry, uh, quicksilver is the substance with the highest degree of osmosis. OK. Uh, well. So that there is no trace. I don't know if it's degree or, yeah. the, or the speed, but it, it, it's, it goes together to the point where there is no trace left of... So it reunites like... So it unites oh, okay. completely, I'm perfectly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the second, like Quicksilver, then the third, then the fourth. Then the, fifth. the community of the five friends, yes. though, has no real basis. They're called friends. But they said, we don't even really know one another. All we have is the fact that we stood in front of the door one day. And, and we exclude the six. And we exclude the six. So that's actually, so, so Kafka's idea of a community is, it's not based on some other ties. And I mean, you've, you wrote a book called When Kafka Says We, and you've thought a lot about how Kafka tries to let us understand what is a community and what is a single individual. Um. What is remarkable about this little story is that it ends on a fantastic miniature sentence. However much the six wants to join us, we push him away. And the last three words, but back he comes. <laughs> but yeah. back he comes. Yeah. <laughs> er kommt wieder. <laughs> Um, huh. Now, this, first of all, is a kind of hopeful moment yeah, yeah. where you know that these closed communities will, you know, will never actually be able to close themselves completely. Because but as you said, they also need, because the, they need, they need the other one to be excluded. So in some ways they even... But it is also the insight that you had right at the beginning when you said you were happy for a moment. Yes. <laughs> Because it is the insight, like what, the sixth, why the hell does he want to join such a horrible community? Well, he wants to join them because, because, he, wants, because he wants to have a home, he wants to belong. Mm -hmm. And the whole danger of that belonging to a closed group mm -hmm. is included in the insight, in, in Kafka's capacity, to also realize, so it's not just this political, you know, we have today many um, counter ideologies that just spoke, speak of, you know, the ideal of exile, of nomadism, of being nowhere, of being, you know, of, uh, but there is the insight. What you need, and I'm sure you need it in politics as well, and maybe that is something that literature can provide, the insight into the into the 
you know, the, the needs that do create this danger, the very fact that the sixth one needs to join. Mm -hmm. Without understanding that, I don't think that you can understand, mm -hmm. I mean, you brought in, you know, the oh. America today. I think, uh, and it doesn't mean understanding in a kind of moral, right. moral way, but even to grasp the situation. Okay. If you don't, if you don't see that that sixth one, you know, crazy as that is, yeah. does continue to want to join. You, you know, you can't assess the, the very situation. Now, you know, even but that's actually quite interesting to go back to the mouse parable. You're saying without knowing that the sixth continues to show up and always wants to join and will both be excluded and be necessary for the five to feel like five who belong together. You have to realize that that's going to happen. So it can't be the promise of another cat to say, oh, we'll allow the six to join. We'll bring everybody in. There's no problem. We'll open everything. He's saying that is not understanding what Kafka is trying to say, how community actually works. Because he said, you are actually denying this other part, that the exclusion is part of what a community is. Yeah, but there is something, of course, terrifying in it. Because of it course. Does not give, uh, <laughs> it does not give a solution. It does not really provide you with a, you know, it, does, yeah, but it, prevents, way, but it prevents that. I mean, it prevents that sense of, uh, of deep unsettlement that doesn't make a, you know, that would make a cat impossible. Uh, the cat, the whole right. cat talk. Right. Uh, but, but the cat, if the cat were the redeemer and the cat, the cat also takes you in, yeah. absorbs you totally. So in some ways, let's say the cat's terrifying, eats you up, that's horrible, so it's terrifying. But there is no other option in Kafka in some ways to say there is no, so I, I, I like the other part when you said the sentence ends and he comes back. It's sort of what the world is. What you said very early right now, that there's always something happening that's going to be distracting or disrupting or a little thing that you don't anticipate yeah. because you think you've mastered your life in the world and then something contingent happens. And it's going to keep on happening. Yeah, but there is also, I wouldn't say that it's all bleak. There is in Kafka, mm -hmm. and it's small as well, mm -hmm. but there are huge possibilities in that, in that small, and I would say small because there are moments, there are situations, but there is, there is something. And I, I'm going to give you, if, if I can do that quickly, I'm going to give you an... Give me uh, a little light. A little There's a little light, light from under light. the door coming there, and maybe something, okay. right? There's, so give me a little light. <laughs> you know, by the way, the five and six, just to... to I always thought that was totally contingent. Why did he choose five. the number five right. and the number six? Right. Well, I always thought it's just because it's not three and it's not seven. They're magical numbers. Okay. Magical numbers. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I discovered it when I, uh, when I taught a class. It was in the middle of a class. I taught Zarathustra. Okay. And there is a, there is a section called uh, Über die Nächstenliebe. Yeah. And Fernstenliebe. On it's loving your, your neighbor and Nietzsche, or yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, loving yeah. your neighbor, right? Yeah. Where Nietzsche makes fun of the Christian idea of neighborly love. Yeah, which which uh, Freud later on says not everyone is lovable, famously, yeah, okay. right? <laughs> um, so in this Nietzsche, little Nietzsche in Zarathustra uh, writes about you know makes fun that the next neighbor is actually only loving your own. And what you should practice is loving the one who is distant, yeah, Franz yeah. Liebe. And there's a sentence there, and I read it in class, and suddenly, wherever five are together, a sixth must die. Now, it still doesn't explain why the five and the six, but I would be surprised if yeah. Kafka hadn't read that and the five and the six stayed. Uh, a light. There is for me a moment in a pretty dark story where the light shines. And not only that, where there is something that shines up uh, that may be there to stay. And it does have to do with literature. Before you quoted Kafka saying, 
you know, I am. I'm nothing but nothing literature. But literature. Yes. Uh, maybe that is where um, that that is a way to understand what he means when he says that. I found that in the story uh, called Conversations with a Praying Man. In English, it was translated as Conversation with a Supplicant. I don't think that's correct because the figure called the Praying Man there doesn't pray for anything. Like a supplicant is somebody who. Right, as a demand, yeah. Yeah. Um, it is the. It is a early story of, uh, of Kafka's part of. Betrachtung in eines Kampfes. Uh, Observation, a reflection on a struggle, yeah, yeah. It's a story of a few pages where an, a narrator, so an I, who presents himself from the beginning as a, a stable, self confident, controlling figure, goes into a church. Because his girl is there, wants to see uh, his girl who is praying there for half an hour every day, and he goes there and watches her. One day the girl doesn't come, but there is this crazy guy who is praying with his whole being <laughs> and throwing his skull on the ground while he's praying. So you get something about this half half hour of the girl, but there's something whole about this creature. And he's both fascinated and irritated. He presents itself as irritation, but you, you gradually mm -hmm. see that mm -hmm. there is much more to it. And he says, I'm going to talk to this guy, and I'm going to tell him you can't behave in this way yeah. in a public place. And you know, it's the outrage of the bourgeois who <laughs> sees Someone who a fanatic, a, right? A fanatic, fanatic. but it's really <laughs> what he is. You could see that is he's, he's something of an of an artist. Okay, he stands for huh. the one who has another kind of vision. Okay, and at the beginning, it's very clear that the power is in the hands of the narrator of this I figure, who is gonna. He speaks of a Glücksfang. Yeah. I'm going, you know, and he's going to catch the guy. He's going to get him. And that's again one of these uh, very frequent situations in Kafka's short prose where there is somebody, uh, a creature, and here it's not little in the sense of size, right. but he cannot quite grasp him, catch him, and he says himself, I can only ever imagine him in motion, right. this, this <coughs> praying man. Then there is a conversation between the I figure and the praying man. And in that conversation, the praying man explains himself. And in the midst of that explanation, there is a strange, uh, a strange moment, a little passage that exists in Kafka's diary and that Kafka took from the diary hmm. into the story. And the praying man explains that he has never been certain of his own life out of itself, out of himself, a fundamental uncertainty. Now, you see at the beginning that the narrator gradually becomes unsettled in that encounter mm -hmm. and this whole confidence from the beginning dissolves and then comes the moment when the praying man says you know there are people who live as if things were obvious as if mm. things were self-evident and they speak like that you know I remember as a child, one day my mother, I heard her say, she was on the balcony and she said to the neighbor, hello, uh, it's a nice day today, isn't it? And then the neighbor replies, yes, I will have a picnic in the grass. And the praying man says, can you imagine that 
people talk like that? <laughs> and at that point, the narrator has been so taken in by the praying man that he says, no, no, really? <laughs> Could it be that people talk like that? So the whole madness of normality is being captured in that moment. And the praying man, he, like he's described as being totally paralyzed by the situation. And at that point, the praying man says something fantastic. He says, oh, really? And he looks completely happy and says, oh, but if that is so, then, like then I don't need to have others look at me in the church anymore, which was something that was not to be understood at the beginning of the story, why he would need that. Because then I don't need to be embarrassed anymore that I'm nothing but a shadow. But he says, oh, but then I know we don't need to be embarrassed anymore that we are nothing but shadows hmm. who have, you know, basically disappearing on the street and not walking, you know, strongly. And but that little moment where he shifts from a I don't to a we, that is the other we, because then there is a sense of sharing the vision of the madness of normality that was embodied by these two women. And then, by the two women talking on the balcony, and then the praying man goes on, and he gives a few images that are fantastically powerful senses of the fragility and uh, pre the you know precariousness of reality, of life, of existence, of of basically our sense of what there is. And some of the, you know he says you know the buildings they're just falling apart. There is something expressionist in that you know. Right. Buildings are falling. apart. You know, they or and people are falling dead on the street today already the fifth, and there's right. some comedy in that as well. So there's a, a slapstick moment in the midst of this terror. And you know, today I saw one who died, and somebody <laughs> took him into the house. Yeah. And then I knocked and I said, I, You just took in a dead man. And that the, the man from in the house said, Oh, maybe a dead man, I wouldn't, you know, we are. We are, uh, you know, proper. proper house here, right? You know, we don't take dead we people. Don't take dead people. <laughs> there's there's no nobody dead here. here, right? So, and then there's a, a fantastic little image of there's a big storm coming, and here you can see the whole, you know, the storm mm -hmm. uh, as the, you know, a metaphor of that time. There's something going to come that's going to sweep that whole uh, World. civilization yeah. that went wrong away. But it's also, of course, the premonition of, of war. And he says, but no one is afraid but me, the praying man said. But of course, he says that to one who has shown that he can share this with. And the last few lines of the story, the narrator, totally paralyzed, tortured, tortured as I was, uh, he says. He said, oh, you know, that story before with that the, your mother and the neighbor. I completely understand them. <laughs> I completely, th that is, you know, I, I speak like that. That's how he wants to run back to okay. that normality because he was so deeply unsettled and frightened by, hmm. by these images, by these stories, by these visions of the praying man. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is what literature does mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and what mm -hmm. Kafka can mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. And what does, how does the story end? So he wants to run back. And then the praying man says, admissions are the strongest when one tries to revoke them. What does that mean? Well, he's trying to revoke what he's the admission that he has been touched deeply oh, touched mm. 
yeah. touched to the point where the fear is back, the fear of the mouse that this whole civilization, <laughs> you know, was blown, was blown away. And he wants to run back to the, to the walls, to the, right. he, wants to, he wants to run back to, a, you know, the whole illusion of stability that, uh, that they represent. And, and the praying man says, you know, this is only an admission how deeply you have been touched by this, to the point where there's just no way back. Once you have been, been touched mm -hmm. by this, once you have gone through this experience, once you have encountered the kind of literature that Kafka sees himself writing, that he calls this mad world that he has in his head, right. there's no way back. There's no way back. <laughs> That's nice. But it's in nice, and the narrator still wants to go back. You actually, you get this. It's not a knowledge that c you can capitalize on and use. Very important it's, what you said. It's unsettling and it stays unsettling. No, this is exactly the same thing as with the story and at the, the end, that the wants six to. wants to join. Yeah, yeah. The six still wants to join the belonging and the, right. and the narrator wants to run back yeah, yeah. To, the, to the balcony. But it's, it's interesting, there's this, there's this other line that you know, of course, um, which is much cited from the diaries where Kafka says, you don't have to try anything at all. Just sit down at the table, wait patiently, and the world can do nothing but writhe in agony and reveal itself to you. And so Harold Bloom calls this kind of Gnostic patience, which is a complete paradox in a way, but it's sort of the, the world or this what the praying man reveals to us, it's there. It's actually there, and in some ways the example is so banal that his mother says to a woman in the courtyard, are you gonna, what are you going to do? And she said, I'm going to have a picnic. It's, but in this is something, if you see it. So it, Kafka doesn't go to some external, incredible, transcendent, religious reality. It's always in, so that's why I said, when I said initially, these little tiny creatures and characters, they're in the world. Absolutely. So it's always imminent. So I think this is, so the, if, if there is a light, it's within the world. Absolutely. And the light happens in that moment when, like, like the praying man and the narrator, there is a sharing of that vision, if, even if that vision itself is terrifying. There is something about conveying it, and I think for mm -hmm. Kafka, mm -hmm. in his literature, mm -hmm. he felt that if he could reach, if he could convey this mm -hmm. to another, Mm -hmm. And he was doubting it to the end. That's why he wanted <coughs> everything to be burned. The interesting is he is writing the whole time. And he, so there is a sense it could be conveyed or sh shared for a moment. And there's, there's a very uh, well-known anecdote. He read, um, I think, The Metamorphosis in 1917 in Munich, and he was laughing the whole time. And he thought all of his stories are very, very funny. And then for a long time, Kafka was considered the great pessimist, and it's just all, the, you know, the, the, the end of everything. And you're saying, no, there's, there's also incredible amounts of humor in it. Oh, there which, is. It's very funny, and, and I don't know if I would call it surreal. It's funny, it's almost, um, it's subtle. And you know, <laughs> uh, Benjamin said that uh, the one will be the true reader of... Uh, of Kafka, who realizes the, the, the comic side yeah. of his theology. And for me, I think one <laughs> of the funniest moments is in this letter that he wrote to Robert Klopstock with two paragraphs on Abraham. Oh, yes. <laughs> so this is one of I the mean, funniest. there are several Abrahams, but I do love that. Tell me about that. So, so he's rewriting, or he's sort of explaining what what Abraham in and the it's Bible totally would do. Funny, it's, but it's very funny. Yes, <laughs> but it is also also very deep, uh, and I would say, uh, yeah, it is. I think it would be completely wrong to read this just as straight transgression or straight blasphemy. And there is a, uh, also a tiny hint. Uh, to even a place where, where he would situate God mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that. The story is 
sounds like, you know, he, so uh, he... So first in the Bible, so Abraham is tasked to go up to the mountain, sacrifice his son. He has a child. He's very, very old at this point. Ruth has a child, and, and Ruth laughs in the story. Very, so this is the, the basic story. Sarah, is, yeah. Sarah I'm sorry. Yeah. So Sarah, Abraham yeah. has to sacrifice his son. That's, and then Kafka writes up to it. And Kierkegaard, for Kierkegaard, uh, Abraham, that moment uh, where uh, submitting to God's will goes beyond human ethics is, so Abraham is the knight of faith, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. one of the big knights of faith. And Kafka, in a letter, 1921, in the, he was in a sanatorium, he writes, I imagine another Abraham. This Abraham might not make it to patriarch uh, and barely to old clothes dealer. <laughs> right. uh, I think I have it somewhere. Yeah, go yeah, ahead, go on. But, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I, <laughs> but just tell us, yeah, what he is. So it is actually, he says he is imagining another Abraham. He's imagining another Abraham. One who would, he's a, he's a very pious man and he will, you know, wants to be a good, uh, a good faithful servant of God. Um, although not, mm, not quite one who comes like a... Like a waiter. Like a waiter, <laughs> you know, brings his, you know, the sacrifice. Um, and then he has the most fantastic argument with God. So Abraham is presented to us the one Kafka imagines as saying, you know, I'd be, I'd be delighted to submit to your desire and I would love to do that. It just so happens that I need it here right now. I need it in my house because it's not finished. My house isn't finished yet. And there's always one more thing that is missing. And that's why I, I just, you know, I, I, I can't, can't get away, can't go to Mount Moriah to, to do this. I'm too busy. <laughs> too busy, too busy. Here, here and now. And then there is a, mm -hmm. a wonderful next sentence. These Abrahams deliberately built houses that cannot be finished mm -hmm. so as not to have to lift their eyes and see the mount in the distance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That mount, that is the Mount of Revelation, uh, Sinai, but it's of course the Mount Moriah where it was supposed to sacrifice. Now, it doesn't deny that this is there. Right. It's just, you know, focusing on a house that he has to build and that that house is deliberately built so as not, you know, that it, it cannot be finished. And these Kafka stories are deliberately built. Right, 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 right. They are fragments. And they are fragments that could go on forever. And there is, uh, in German, it's Bauplatz. They stehen mitten am Bauplatz. They, in the these construction Abraham side. stand on the construction <laughs> site. And in German, the word Bauplatz, two years later, he writes, the Bau, the, the burrow. Yeah. And it is the ultimate story that is About unfinished. About a story, yeah. And it is unfinished. Yeah. Because it starts, my, my burrow is finished. In this letter on Abraham, I think there's a sentence also he says, and in the Bible, it also says, you should, oh, right. you should build your house. So it's almost as if he says, well, they're just doing what they're supposed to be doing. They got so busy living and being in the world and building the world that is human, yes. their world, that Absolutely. they just can't right now do this other thing, which and they acknowledge and respect and say, we totally understand. We and have you're right that it says in the Bible already. So it's not that transgression uh, right. that comes from the... Uh, that's what you said before so it's not about from an, it being inside. Yeah, it's in the world. They're, they're living in the world, and the world is never finished. And the human world is a construction, as Kafka, yeah. and there's always contingency. And they say, that's, that's what we're doing. We're living. Then there's a demand to say, you should sacrifice life to prove that you are my servant. Yeah. We'd, we'd love to do yeah. that, but right now... The living it keeps us so busy. Yeah. So there's something in Kafka, also the little details and all the little things. There's so much contingency happening all the time. Yeah. And it's at the same time, as I said much earlier, probably not totally correctly, general or somehow generalizable. That it's a house, it's this, because it's, it's a friend. Because it's the everyday life of, of, that of is what is being affirmed here. 
is the everyday life without uh, denying yeah. Yeah. the and you know it's even it's not transgressive in the sense of the bible because abraham in the bible is negotiating all the time you know right. god wants to destroy yeah. so he just right. takes you know he takes that right. moment of, uh, when god wants to destroy sodom and it's not just the bible don't you think it's also that everybody is negotiating like the mouse can't negotiate with tradition with tradition or with ideology that Kafka sort of allows this to say your hand at something. The trial is basically one long book about someone who's accused of something. He doesn't quite know what. And he wants to figure out of what he's accused and what's the law. And that is the trial itself. He actually ends up being basically, yeah. he never gets to a real trial, but finding out what he did wrong and all of this. So the process of negotiation is, can end up being your salvation or redemption, or it could be your punishment. And it's the perfect example. The ending of the trial is the perfect example. Uh, like it's the counter example of those who stand on their building site uh, and building houses that cannot be finished because at the end of the trial, the two men, right. so at the beginning it starts with two men who walk into uh, into his room. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, wakes up and someone walks in and says, we're here to the two men summon the, you to the court. You're, you're arrested. Yeah. Uh, so. And these two, they are at the beginning of the novel, they, are, they have names and they are, they are still more or less separate. At the, at the, in the last lines of, of the trial, the two don't have names. They've become identical, of same height, it mm. says because they, they are cheek to cheek. After, so after they've put the knife mm -hmm. into, into his body, to his heart, uh, they are cheek to cheek and they look at, so what they're looking at is the, the victim, the, the person, the man they have murdered. And it says, I was always fascinated by that. They, they are looking at the the entscheidung, the decision. They're looking at the so the <laughs> the dead man, the mm. dead human is equated with the word decision. Mm. With putting an end and you know in German Entscheidung is the undoing of something that is separate. Mm. And it's the fusion, it's the closure. And closure in that sense yeah. is uh, identified with murder. And yeah. if you bring it back to the building site, yeah, 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 right. Where so life you know, is open-endedness and unfinished, and, and, and Kafka is, stories is and actually the, life, the whole life was. So you see, there are yeah. some lights. And I like it actually to think that literature and even these tiny stories, they're always opening up in an unfinished way. So it's not that they are incomprehensible or sort of paradoxical. It's not the point. The point is not to be to then keep us guessing to what could be the right solution or people have tried to undo these parables. They say the point is that you are brought into a space you engaged and you stay there and it will not be finished because closure could be. You know the burrow ends on uh, but everything remained the same and in the manuscript so in the in the uh, older published yeah. versions, there was a full stop after, but everything remained the same. So after this whole, right. but in the manuscript, there's a comma, <laughs> continues that, and then right. literally, literally off. open, good, good. <laughs> and uh, probably Kafka just, you know, there was, sometimes he finds ways, and that's a, a, a wonderful place to go to if you want to get into reading Kafka, to just look at the endings and how he mm -hmm, manages mm -hmm. to end, so very often they're fragments, but very often the endings, especially of these little texts, mm -hmm. they, they manage to open up an infinite loop mm -hmm. at the end. For example, what we read before about the one who comes back and right. comes to her vida, so yeah, you, right. you feel right. there's an infinite loop. And in, with, that, with the story of, of the borough, uh, you know, uh, right. it's the ultimate, just... It said, the, the other one, I'm going to finish with this one. Um, I love this one, I told you about this. So the leopards invade the temple all the time and they break everything and they just crash into the temple and they drink out of all the 
you know, these sacred objects, the urns. And then after a while, people can anticipate when the leopards come and destroy the temple and disrupt everything. And then when the leopards arrive, becomes part of the ritual of the temple. So it's a loop. You incorporate the disruption, Beautiful. the destruction, but it's, and then you, the story sort of both self-contained and totally open. Because the invasion of the leopards is kind of this, I think. So, so Vivian, thank you so much. <laughs> so, I love the open-ended ending, so we have to continue. So at some point, I'll hope to have you back. Um, and I do want to thank you for actually reading Kafka in this really generous way to open it up. It's really a, it's because he has been read so many times to serve sort of interpretive models or ideologies mm -hmm. that have sort of, and there's, there's a famous sentence in one of his books, uh, a cage went in search of a bird. And it's a little bit like interpreters went in search of Kafka and stick him into their interpretation. So. Wonderful. <laughs> really, I thank you for having Thank you. So much fun. Great.